All right, I need somebody to get up out of their seat and begin to give God great praise in this place. Oh, 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 oh. If you know he's been good to you, oh, let me see you put those Holy Ghost hands together and begin to give God great praise in this place. Oh, you were so good. We let you good in your mercy. The West Coast Youth Conference is coming up and you don't want to miss it. If you're a young person, it's a place that you have to be. This is the premier urban youth conference taking place on the West Coast. We have a virtual conference that's coming up in August. The dates are on the screen. Make sure that you're present. Make sure that you plan to attend this. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors. The West Coast Youth Conference, you don't want to miss it. And also in 2023, taking place in Phoenix, Arizona, we have the big West Coast Youth Conference. The one that we have every few years, if you remember the one from just a couple of years ago, it was a great time. And this one is going to be even better. The dates, the location is on the screen. You don't want to miss the West Coast Youth Conference. What's up, young people? Welcome to Shift 2021, where we are trying to make sure you shift in the right direction. Listen, guys, this is the second gear of our nightly program. And let me ask my co-host some questions. Could you tell us what we got lined up for our youth on this week? We have an amazing program. On the first night, we have Pace Fordham. He's an excellent speaker coming all the way down from Oakland University. On our second night, we have Janelle Monroe, mm -hmm. an amazing uh, pastor that I met up at Andrews University. Uh, she's going to bring a wonderful word. She's coming out from Maryland. And then on our third night and Sabbath morning, we have Garrison Hayes. He's yes. an amazing youth and young adult pastor, and I know he's going to bring a powerful message for you guys. Now, all of these speakers have amazing content on the internet. You want to Go, mm -hmm. You want to go check them out on Instagram just to see who they are, but I promise you, you're not going to miss anything great when you tune in with these guys. So what time do we start? Uh, we start at 6 o'clock every night mm -hmm. and 10.30 on Sabbath, and each program is going to have a very streamlined uh, program. So we're going to have uh, opening prayer, welcome, some music, and get straight into the Word. What? So you mean no children's story? No children's story. This program is about you. Wow. So you guys are going to love this. You have to tune in to SECC Youth on YouTube. That's where you can find all of our programs. 6 p.m. you said, right? 6 p.m. And? 
10.30 on Sabbath. 10.30 on Sabbath morning. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for joining in. Now is the time when our hearts can open and pour out a praise to you. Cause we know that things change when we call on your name. There's nothing you cannot do. Desire to draw closer as we seek your face. In your presence, there is power. So we ask you to fill this space. Yeah. Hey. Cause we are standing on the rock of your promise. And we are leaving. in your ways, so we give you all our praise, oh Lord, we worship you in this place, yeah, 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 oh, in this place, yeah. standing on the rock of your promise and we are leaning on the everlasting arms cause you are perfect in your ways so we give you all our praise oh lord we worship you oh lord we worship you oh lord we worship you
Amen. Thank you so much for that beautiful song, Danny. I just want to pray before we get into the word. Let's bow our head. Dear Jesus, please flood this place with your presence. Pour the Holy Spirit out. God, we need a connection with you. We need a touch from you. I'm asking that you reveal yourself in this place. Help us to get just one other facet of who you are today. Um, we love you. Thanks for loving us. Continue to help us to realize more and more of what that love really means for us in real life. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for all you're doing. Help us to continue to trust you on these life journeys. We love you. Thanks for loving us. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right, y'all. So the book I want to come out of today is Romans. Just shameless plug. If y'all need something to read, read the book of Romans. You're going to have to read it a couple times. That joint's crazy. You're going to have to like, like go over that. You might have to go ask some people for head to, bro, read Romans. That joint is crazy. We're going to start in Romans 8. You know, we've been talking about the cross. We've been talking about what the, what the, the events that was at the cross, what it actually meant for us, what it meant conceptually. Um, you know, I grew up in church. I'm a pastor's kid. You know, I was a uh, drum corps captain. I was Bible Bowl captain. You know, you can't out church me. Like I was the churchiest church kid ever. And we heard about the concept of the gospel so much, heard about the cross so much, but I'm going to let y'all in on a little secret. A lot of times we can go to church every week, every Sabbath, and still not know what none of this means for me. So I just pray that God uses this moment now for us to actually understand what does this really mean for me? We get all the church jargon. You know, we hear big words like sanctification, justification, glorification. We hear, we hear words like tribulations and stuff. It's like, bro, no, speak, speak English. And I was in class and one of my teachers asked me to answer a question. They're like, Pace, use theological words. I was like, no, because real people don't know theological words. We got to be simple. We got to be, if you can't explain it in a sentence, then you don't need to be talking. We need to be simple. So I just want to come out of Romans verse that God gave me that God's been putting on my heart. We pray that the Holy Spirit speaks that y'all don't hear pace, but y'all hear the Holy Spirit coming out of Romans eight. We can start with verse one, but what we're really focusing on is verse four. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. I'm going to say that again. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you, has past tense, freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Verse three, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. In that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. I'm going to do, I'm gonna do the, the second clause in that verse again, just to, just to get it. So God did what the law could not do, sent his son, his son, his son own body in, in bodies we sinners have. In that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Verse four, this is what I want to I wanna really pinpoint. He did this so that the requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow the sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Verse four, again, you know, sometimes we just skim over stuff, but I want to really like, we got to get, we got to get this into us. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you, if you like me and you're an audible learner, you got to hear, you got to have the flashcards. You got to know, like, let me, let me hear this more. It says he did this. He did this so that the requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us for Pace, for Christian, for Q, for Danny, for Tygea. So the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Um, Jesus continued to speak. God, I mean, so y'all, we, we hear the concept of sin so much. We hear the concept of the cross so much. We hear the concept of being freed from sin so much, but we don't really get what sin is. If I was to raise a show of hands and I said, what is sin? A lot of us would say, you know, lying, stealing, cheating, lusting, coveting. We would name all these actions, but that doesn't go as deep of, as what sin actually is. What sin is, is actually the condition of being separated from the standard of what God is. Um, a way that someone put it that I really, I really like, darkness technically isn't a thing. It's a concept. Light is a thing. You could theoretically pick up light. You could pick up a proton and that would be you holding light. All darkness is, is the absence of light. And, in relative, and when you relate it to light, to pure light, you get to see what darkness actually is. Sin 
is not making not making the standard of the perfect set that God has actually arranged. You're not matching up to what God is. If we look at Greek, the word sin, hamartelos, hamartia, it actually just means to miss the mark. If we look at how it's been used in history, it was actually used by people who would throw spears and shoot bow and arrows, meaning this was the, this was the bullseye and you did not make it. You missed the mark. The standard was that bullseye and you were however far away from meeting that bullseye. If we go to Hebrew, the word is a little different connotation. It actually means you're off course. You know, the Israelites groups in that, in that, in those, those cultures, they were nomadic tribes. They used to be on paths. They used to go in different places. And what it actually meant was you were off course. You were not on the right path. The word they used for sin meant that there was a destination and you were off course of that destination. You weren't on the right path. So if I'm in Huntsville and I'm trying to get to Nashville, which is north of Huntsville, and I end up in California, I can say I sinned. I got off the path. That's the Hebrew definition. The Greek definition is I'm shooting basketball. My goal is to make it into the hoop. And I break, no matter how much I break, if I airball, if I, if I miss, I missed it. I did not make the standard. I wasn't good enough to match up to the standard. Another way we can look at it, you know, I'm only like 5'8". They're like, praise God, I can ride rides. I'm talking for ride rides. But there was a point in my life where I was too short to ride roller coaster rides. I didn't match up to the standard that was required for me to be on that journey of life. I didn't match up. There was nothing I could do to, to, to build myself, to get up to the standard, to actually be, to, to grow, to fight for it. There was nothing I could do to actually win the st- and, and get up to the standard of being right with God. There's nothing we can do to be right with God. A lot of times we just think of sin as the things we do, but sin is a condition. It's a sickness. The things we do are the symptoms of that sickness. We talk about like, like Corona is one of the things that's on, on our minds a lot. Imagine getting Corona, God forbid, you go to the doctor and all they give you is a cough drop and then tell you to leave. You would be like, yo, who are you? What's going on? Because they're looking at the symptom and not the actual internal cause of the, the sickness. And so often that's what we do in this concept of sin because we don't understand it. Because we don't know that sin is a heart condition. Sin is the condition of being separated from God. It's the condition of being born away from the standard, being born away from the standard that is life and life giving. That, that means that we actually inherit death because we don't earn life. You, it's, it's just math. It, it makes sense. Because we don't reach the standard, we need something bigger than just fighting the symptoms. So often we spend all this time self-help books, you know, trying to use our discipline, trying to use our motivation to stop lusting, stop coveting. But we need something bigger. You got shot and you're trying to put a Band-Aid over it. No, nah, bro, you need surgery. You need like, there's something big that needs to happen in your heart. You tore your ACL and you're trying to say, no, I'm just going to walk it off. No, it needs something bigger than that. We need something bigger than that. A lot of times we just talk about what the cross is, but we don't understand what the cross was actually doing. As we read in verse four, I'm going to read again. He did this. So the requirement of the law will be fully fulfilled for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. The standard of life is here. You know, God, Jesus and God calls himself the way, the truth, and life. We can actually look at the definitions I gave. The way. If sin is being you're off track and God is the way, he is giving you the destination for the track that you fell off of. That, that, that's the, the remedy of sin there. He's, he's the truth. All, we use the darkness analogy. A good lie, we know, isn't just something made up. It's a twist of the truth. It's a, t- it's a tint of the truth. It's something where the truth is twisted or shaped or, 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 or moved around in a way where it shows it in a different light. If he's the truth, he's the pure light, he's the light of the world, and I'm just a little bit dark, he's the, he's the one who covers me. He's the one who, who covers what my problem was. Using more, I'm just trying to describe this in, in layman's terms we understand it. Let's use more math. The concept of infinity. It's the biggest, the biggest conceptualized number we can think of. Think of God's goodness as infinity. Think of God's grace, grace as infinity. We, we as humans are finite. We can use so many numbers to describe ourselves. You know, we can say our age, I'm 21. We can say our height, we can say our weight. We can describe ourselves. If I was to describe my goodness, I'll give myself a 50. You know what I'm saying? I can give myself a 50. There might be other people who might look in the Bible like maybe Paul might've been in a hundred. You know what I'm saying? Maybe he was a great guy. Maybe there's someone, we look at Hitler and we, we would say, oh, he's probably like a negative 17. Mathematically, though amongst ourselves, we may think that there's a different standard. 
when you compare it to the standard of infinity, we are all infinity away from being to the standard. We have all fallen short. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We all don't meet the standard. We are all in the condition of sin using the same light analogy. It don't matter how dark a room is, it's dark. We don't go around walking in the rooms, well, this is only 40% dark, you know, th that room was 50% dark, this room 60% dark compared to the light, you know, this we don't do that. We just know it's dark. That joy is dark and I cannot see. And that's what God sees when he sees us. He not looking at, look, well, Pace did this at a certain way, you know, Pace, Pace did this in a certain way. Oh, he wasn't as bad as this. You know, his situation didn't show this. No, nah, he's dark. I'm pure light and I need to cover his darkness. I need to cover what, what he was born into. He was not good enough to meet this standard. God is the standard of life. And because we aren't matching up to the standard, because we were born in this condition of sin, this condition, this sickness that births these desires, these sinful inclinations. I love how Paul says it because he always says these sinful desires, my sinful desire. He doesn't just, he doesn't just say sin because it's not, it's not that it's like, it's not that all the time we're going out deciding I want to do this. No, nah, bro. It's like, you've seen Venom, the, uh, the, the Spider-Man offshoot movie. It's like a parasite that's on you and that's shifting you and that's molding you and pushing you in a certain direction. Another analogy I like to use, it's like a current. It's like you're getting stuck in the water and you're sinking and the current is pulling you out to sea. The current is pulling you out deeper and deeper. You're not strong enough to fight it. You're not strong enough to swim above it. You're not strong enough to get back to where it's safe. But what the gospel is, you know, we throw words around so much, but we don't get it. I'm tired of us act being all these intellectual scholars. But if you can't explain it to a five-year-old, in my mind, you do not know the information. If you cannot explain something simple, you do not know it. All the gospel is, I'm sinking deep in sin, far, far from the peaceful shore, sinking within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea used his power and his strength. He was stronger than the waves that were, that were holding me back. He was stronger than the waves that were pulling me out. He swam to me, risked his life, and pulled me out of the condition I couldn't pull myself in. That's what the cross is. The cross is the justification of the law that I didn't match up to. God's saying, oh, you missed? I'm going to be the replacement to actually build you back up to the level where, where the standard is. You weren't tall enough? I'm going to sell you some height. I used to talk about, I wish there was an app where we could like cash app like genetic stuff to people. Like, you know, like I used to play a lot of sports, but I don't anymore. So I'm like, I'm pretty athletic, but I would sell some of my vertical to some NBA players. Like they need it. You know what I'm saying? There's no reason. Like I don't play basketball. I don't need to be able to dunk. I don't, I don't need this in real life. I could sell some vertical to some NBA player who needs it. Da, 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 da. Jesus is basically saying, I am so perfect. I am infinitely good that it is, it behooves me to be able to give my goodness to you so that you can match up to the standard. I'm going to wrap my righteousness over Pace's trash. I'm going to write, write, wrap my problems. My, I'm going to wrap, wrap Pace's insecurity with my perfection so that he can actually make it in this world. That's all that this is. The gospel is Jesus coming and saving us from a condition we couldn't save ourselves out of. Y'all getting me real quick? Y'all getting me? Another theological term I'm gonna I'm gonna pour out so that we can we can get this when people try to try to be all PhD scholars and throw words at us. That's justification, being made just. For my uh, political science majors, all it means is you're being acquitted for something that you deserve. I deserve death by not matching up to life. I'm not as good. I'm not on the same league as the way, the truth, and the life. So I deserve death. I am going contrary to the way of God, the, the physics that, that sets up the world, I am opposite to. I, my, my nature, my, the way I am built, my DNA is contrary to how God's perfect law has been ordained. Therefore, I am going to, I, I, I deserve death. But Jesus, in his perfection, said, okay, bet, I'm going to wrap pace up and cover him so that he doesn't have to experience the penalty for his sin. All justification is, is, the pen, is, is being saved from the penalty of your sin. And I'm gonna throw another word to you because you know once we get that, how do we move forward? Always gotta give application because you know we throw these things like Jesus saved me. What does that mean? How do we, how do we move forward? 
Another word I love is sanctification. Justification is saving you from the penalty of sin. But what sanctification is, is saving you from the power of sin. In this verse, if we, if we read it again, in verse two, it says, and because you believe in him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. We have been saved from the penalty of sin, which is death, but it's still around us. It's like we use the same water analogy. I was, I was saved from being, from drowning. The lifeguard is bringing me back to sea. I'm still coughing and stuff. There's water in my lungs. When he does CPR and starts to fix the effects that sin has had on me, that's sanctification. He starts to save me from what's, what's been done bad to me because of this sin. I, I'm not in the current anymore. I'm not being dragged away. I'm free. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to anxiety. I'm no longer a slave to lust. I'm no longer a slave to depression because God has stepped in and been that and been that justification to, to bridge the gap. And he's also been that doctor to heal me from the effects. He's also been that person to pull me out. So often we talk about God, the father and God, the son so much, but we don't talk about God, the spirit. God the Father, he made the earth, went up to heaven, sat on the throne. God the, God the Son, he died for our sins, went to heaven, sat on the throne. But what he said was, when I'm leave, I'm going to leave you a helper to lead you into all truth, to reveal the things that I already revealed myself. I'm going to leave you a helper to actually get you through this life journey. Going back to the word in Hebrew, all it means is you got off the course. I'm going to give you a helper that gets you back on the right path. I'm going to read the verse again because, you know, we, bro, read the book of Romans. That's your homework. I'm going to be asking y'all individually too. just go read the book of Romans. The law of Moses was unable to save us. The law was just criteria that we had designed that God gave us to be able to see a mirror of how bad I actually am. The law was really just a setup to say, bro, this is, this is a glimpse of the standard. You're not good enough. You need something better. That's all the law was. That, that's really what it, it, God was saying, bro. I'm just going to write out 10, 10 things that really point to two things, which is love God and love people. First half is love God. Second half is love people. And it's going to show you every day how bad you are at doing it and prove to you that you need help. It's going to show you every day how sick you actually are and prove that you need a doctor and turn you back to me. That's the point of the law. But we took it and said, I'm going to try my best to fight for this thing. I'm going to try my best to keep the whole letter of the law, to be the perfect Christian, to, to, to be the perfect, the perfect whatever, to be amazing, to do all this stuff without Jesus. And God's like, bro, that wasn't the point. The point was so you could see that you were going to fail and get some help. It was so you could see that you were going to fail and get wrapped up in my spirit so that I could drag you out. You know, use it, we use the same analogies all the time because they work. But using the lifeguard analogy, if anybody's ever been a lifeguard, they tell you to wait until the person stops fighting until you save them. Because so often we try to fight and it ends up being more of our downfall than actually letting the person bigger than us bring us out of the problem we let ourselves into. So often we try to take things like the Ten Commandments, take the Sabbath, take, take being a vegetarian, all these random things we've thrown in life, all these that they're not bad. They're good concepts, but we take it and put it in my power and not God's power. That's the problem. And even so, that shifts our, our thinking to make us look at ourselves as better than other people because we keep the law differently than they do. Because we sin in, our, in the security of our own room and not publicly. Because, because you're addicted to porn, but he had a kid. And it's the same sin. It's the same sexual sin, but he had something to show for it. We look at people different because we think it's something I'm working for. So we look for fruit of that instead of realizing, no, the same analogy. I am infinitely broken and he is infinitely good. He is, he is covering me. He is covering everything wrong with me. Pace is a problem, but God covers him. Pace is broken, but God covers him. Y'all get what I'm saying? Bro, like, I'm just trying to make like as clear as possible. If we can't go back and like in a month from now, explain this in a sentence, we don't get it. All it is, I'm broken, God saves. Jesus' name in Hebrew literally just means God saves. That's literally what it meant. So when Jesus says, I'm coming to you, I'm coming to your house, believe in me, all he's saying is believe that God saves. That's crazy, right? He's saying, I'm, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. He's saying, oh yeah, God saves is coming to your house today. 
when we believe that God is our savior, that's when the process of justification and sanctification can take place. We can be covered and brought out of the, the, the effects of our sinful nature. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we engage in this path? You know, we talked about how the Hebrew definition is I'm off the course. How do we get back on the path? You know, I'm, I'm saved from the effects. How do I stay on the effects? I love the tenses used in this thing because it talks about once you believe, you have already been free. You have already been made right. The spirit is already with you. So often we sing songs like, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We think in church, we think of the Holy Spirit like, you know, we just, we just think about it, it's dancing and, you know, it's a feeling. No, the fact, so I, I want to I wanna get a little theological, but I, I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. I talked about earlier, Jesus, he died here, went back to heaven. God made the earth, went back to heaven. Jesus says that he will never leave or forsake you but Jesus is in heaven. Who the person who's the Godhead that is with you, never leaving or forsaking you is the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the Godhead that is never leaving you or forsaking you. The Holy Spirit isn't this figment of our imagination, this, this, this spirit that just pops up every once in a while when we in church and praise and worship. No, the spirit was with you from the day you were born to the day you die. The spirit is with you right now. The spirit is in your room with you right now. The spirit is in your, as soon as you accept Jesus, what you're accepting is his spirit to be manifested in your life, to be that helper, to guide you through life. So often we talk about, you know, something told me to go the different way from work and, you know, there was an accident. That was the Holy Spirit. We, we talk about, you know, uh, we, we talk about how, um, the, you know, people tell you in tests, go with your first answer. You think that was just you or you think the Holy Spirit led you there? The Holy Spirit isn't just a feeling. The Holy Spirit is the Godhead that's not leaving you or forsaking you. That's leading you into all truth. And so often we are neglecting the Holy Spirit in our lives and wondering why we don't feel God. We're turning our eyes from him. We're not real. The Holy Spirit never left you. We just aren't acknowledging him. The Holy Spirit never left you. We just think the Holy Spirit is just, is just playing sevenths on the piano and, and getting, the, and getting you know what I'm saying, dancing. That's what we think the Holy Spirit is. But my Bible says, as soon as you accept Jesus is when the outpouring of the Spirit happens in your life. We learn it through Acts. We learn it through Romans. We learn it through Ephesians. We learn it through Galatians, that the Holy Spirit is the remedy to this sickness of sin. This condition of being separated from God, this condition of not meeting the standard, this condition of not being good enough to earn life is being remedied by the Holy Spirit producing the fruits of God actually building that thing in me. I'm making myself clear, right? I'm just, I'm just trying to, to make this joint as, clean, as plain as possible. As I, as I begin to, to wrap up, if you want to follow the, if you want to let the Holy Spirit permeate your life, if you want to say, yo, I know you've been here forever, but I want to actually believe you. I want to see you. I want to feel you in my life. I just want you to know it, we make it so much harder than, than it really is. You know, we try to make this so difficult. We try to act so smart. But my Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. My Bible also says in at least two gospels that whoever asks for the spirit will receive it. If our, if our uh, fathers can give good gifts to our children when they ask, how much more will our infinitely good father give good gifts to those who ask, give the spirit to those who ask? Y'all catch me, right? We've been talking about this whole idea of the cross. We've been in church our whole lives. We've been hearing this forever, but we, we not getting it. And we can tell because we not living it. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I was, I was drowning. I was not strong enough, but someone who was strong enough, someone who the water wasn't bigger than, someone who defeated the waves, the things that were the current that was dragging me out to my death came and risked his life to save me and is bringing me back into right communion with him. That's the gospel. That's it. That's it. If you want to accept that, I just want to pray that we accept the Holy Spirit. Also, if you want to make a public declaration that you want to be on team Jesus, another thing we make, I said this all the time, we make baptism bigger than it is. I don't know if y'all watch college basketball, but they always have decision day. Where it's a, you know, it's a, it's a dude, you know, his, he, his mom and dad next to him, got a bunch of hats on the table, and he picks up Duke. He says, I decide to take my talents to Duke. That's who I'm going to play for. All baptism is, 
is an outward expression of saying what team you want to play on. I want to be on team God. I'm saying through the ups and downs of this life journey, I know that this team is going to get me through. I want what this team has for me. I want to get the hat. I want to choose this team. That's all I want. If you want to be baptized, just make that inclination in the chat. We have people who will come reach out for you. We have people who will come pray for you. If you want to be on team Jesus, just make it known. If you want to accept the spirit in your life, if you want to stop running from the spirit leading you into all truth, leading you into all, all good, leading you into being a better representation of who God can be in this earth to others. I just want you to make that known. Accept Jesus in this place today and we can pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. God, we accept you. I'm asking that you pour your spirit out on this campus, pour your spirit out on this community, pour your spirit out on redemption, pour your spirit out on, on us for the rest of our lives as we go into the highways and byways. You know, there's a story uh, in Mark where there's a guy with demons. He, Jesus saves them. Jesus heals them. He asked to remain with Jesus in this moment, but he says, no, go and tell other people what God did for you. And I'm asking that we don't stay where it's comfortable, that we don't stay in this moment of worship but we actually go out and remind others of how God actually saved us. Go out and show others what it actually means to be loved. God, you know, I, I'm very passionate about the idea that so many of us have the name of Christian, but don't actually know how to communicate it. God, I'm asking that you, you touch our tongues, that you, you, you may start a revolution, God. Start a revolution that's, that stems from redemption, that stems from this community, so that we can be better representations of your love better representations of what it means to be some, a sinner saved by grace, saved by the infinite power of your love. God, we love you. We need you. We're thanking you in advance from the ways you're going to show yourself in this place, the way you're going to show your glory, show your power, show your might. God, I'm asking that you continue to walk with us, continue to talk with us, help us to experience you more and more, help us to have a personal idea of who you are, an intimate relationship with you. We love you. Thanks for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Man, Pastor Fordham did a fantastic Amazing job. Amazing job. Man, listen, guys, you want to make sure that you like tonight's program, you subscribe to it, and you share it with somebody else. Someone needs to hear that message and be encouraged about what Christ is doing in their lives. You want to also make sure that you join us back here tomorrow night at 6. So please, right now, we're going to close in our benediction, but like, subscribe, and share this with somebody else. Please join me in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you so much for the amazing sermon that we heard, the wonderful music, and just the overall program, This Shift. I pray that you please be with every youth who's listening. I pray that this message not only uh, help them get through today, but also throughout the rest of the year. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Have a good night, guys. See you guys tomorrow.